Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar, Crossing the Licensing Chasm, Chasm, How to Transition to a Reoccurring Revenue Model Today. Our first speaker today is Joshua Bloom, partner at Simon Kucher and Partners. Joshua will share insights and licensing model transitions from Simon Kucher's Global Pricing Study. Joshua is joined by Bill Garber with Trimble, Inc. Bill will discuss the licensing evolution Trimble is experiencing as they continue to evolve both their go-to-market strategy and their back office management systems to support how their business has changed over the years. From overcoming the challenges facing hardware manufacturers when it comes to delivering licenses on larger scale machines to introducing new reoccurring revenue models to support as a service requirement, Trimble has successfully crossed the licensing chasm by combining licensing, pricing, and billing. Our last speaker today is Andres Botero, Chief Marketing Officer at ARIA Systems. Andres will tell us how reoccurring revenue models create numerous revenue moments throughout the customer lifetime. So without further delay, I'll turn the webinar over to Joshua with Simon Kucher. Joshua? Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm excited to share learnings today from our experience helping companies transition to recurring revenue models. Uh, a little bit about uh, context and what type of experience and benchmarks we bring to the table. Simon Kucher and Partners is the worldwide leader in the field of top-line growth consulting. Uh, we help companies uh, with marketing challenges, strategy, sales, and pricing. We've been around for over 30 years. We have 1,000 employees worldwide. Uh, and uh, our core competency really is in the area of pricing, uh, which is obviously closely linked to transitions in, in revenue models. So why are we talking about kind of recurring revenue models and uh, what the real kind of uh, technical challenge is? What I hope to bring today is not just uh, kind of inspiration around companies that have cha crossed the chasm successfully, but help to paint a picture of the, the overall pattern of companies that do this well, not just how they are able to cross that technical chasm, but how they are able to succeed in a new monetization model. Uh, and the number one takeaway I want people to have from this talk is that what's fundamentally changing about your monetization model before and after you go to a recurring revenue model is this idea that you're, you're moving from one-time upfront revenue to a recurring revenue model that is highly dependent on the concept of land and expand. I think everybody has heard about land and expand as a buzzword. Um, but I'm, I, part of my goal today is to, to help share some of the kind of first principles behind why that is an important topic and, and give you some tips and tricks around how to operate in that model. Uh, so the first thing I want to share is just uh, the unit model economics from a large-scale study that was done with over 200 SaaS companies. And it really brings home the point that uh, the customer acquisition cost for a dollar of annual contract value uh, is essentially more than a dollar when you're landing a new logo, uh, but obviously a fraction of that when you're doing activities like upsell, cross-sell, usage, or metering, or expansion, or increases at renewal. Uh, and that really drives home the point that in a, in a recurring revenue model where kind of extracting full customer lifetime value is the name of the game, uh, it's a much more efficient kind of sales model to be able to create uh, something that is a, a digestible uh, land target and then focus uh, a significantly greater part of your energies on the expansion side. That's essentially the, the most efficient way to drive long-term revenue. So I'll share examples of how companies tackle these and really look at each of those three levers I just talked about. Uh, talking about upsell, uh, things like tier upgrade and cross-sell, usage, metering and licensing, and retention, kind of how to boost net retention dollars through a combination of increases at renewal and churn reduction. And the, the benchmark I want to share here is uh, we've also done a study of the uh, success rate that people have across these different dimensions. Essentially, if you're looking at a dollar of ACV 
and you're trying to figure out what is a, a really high performing rate of growth of that dollar over time, the most successful companies, the top 15% are able to grow those installed base bookings by 20% plus per year through a combination of the top three options. Not everybody gets there. The average is about kind of exactly a dollar retention uh, once you factor in churn, but the really high performing ones are using all three of these levers to have that be a, a true source of growth for the company. So what's the best way to look at this? Uh, the first perspective I'll share is that the tools that are used to tackle these topics aren't fundamentally different from your standard Marketing 101 playbook. We're talking about things like packaging uh, to balance what you land and what your upsell path is. We're talking about segmentation to really understand whether you have crafted offers that are for the right segment that derive long-term value and help you retain customers. And we're talking about things like pricing or monetization models um, to really extract value for usage. That's the first order of, uh, of business is really understanding those basic building blocks. I, I would say the advanced topic here is within each of those, what is special about a recurring revenue model? How is it different from these concepts that you would have applied elsewhere? And I'll start with the packaging side and, and show examples of this in a second as well. When we think about packaging in a recurring revenue model, one of the most important things is, is uh, the traditional concept of fencing. Do you have clear limits in place to enable upsell and avoid cannibalization that give you that kind of cost efficient way to, to generate revenue over time? And in a large part, seeding. Are you seeding premium features at a relevant point in the customer journey? Instead of trying to get everything in a hardware or perpetual license model and uh, handing off a lot of shelfware to people, uh, the question becomes not just holding those elements back of kind of advanced functionality that consumers might want and customers might want over time, but are you introducing them at the, at the appropriate point when they're ready to adopt them? From a segmentation perspective, it becomes even more critical to really understand use cases and roles of, of your potential buyers. Uh, are the targets uh, clear for what your land offering should be? And from a price increase perspective, are you actually able to distinguish between customers who are churn risks and those that can absorb price increases? Lastly, from a price model perspective, uh, there is a land element here as well. Are you using contract structures that overcome budgeting hurdles? And then the expand part, are you drafting on the organic growth of some underlying business metric? So to put a little more detail behind each of these, I'll share examples. When we talk about things like feeding, uh, fencing and seeding uh, from a packaging perspective, I think a lot of us who are kind of in the marketing, finance, product management disciplines uh, have spent time looking at things like transaction data to understand cross-product purchase patterns. Um, but the really untapped field and what's possible given kind of uh, SaaS deployment models for the large part is actually looking at usage data to make some of these calls about what features and functionality should be included at different levels of your product offering. Uh, and one way to look at this is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to find from a, a fencing perspective, a seating perspective, we're trying to find features that are correlated with the underlying value of your offering. Uh, and oftentimes it's difficult to price along that specific dimension of let's say number of sessions or how much time people are spending in an application. Um, but you want to identify features uh, and create paywalls around things that are fundamentally tied to the long-term value that people get out of your product. That's really on the left-hand side. And once you've identified those features, really understanding is this value realized over time? So on the right-hand side, you have a look at more of a cohort analysis of saying, how many months, given a number of months since registration, what is the actual usage of that particular feature? Breaking that, that out by the top percent, two percent of monthly active users, top four percent of monthly active users. And you can start to see patterns around which are the features that uh, actually increase in usage over time. So this concept of seeding is giving people a limited exposure to those in perhaps an entry-level product and then creating a paywall around that. Uh, so you can look at this chart and, and you can figure out if we gave somebody five usage uh, elements of this type of uh, feature, then we'd know that in over a six-month period, the top 4% of monthly active users would hit that paywall. 
again, this is a kind of rich user data that's only possible it, typically in SaaS platforms, but it's another way to think about how to fence and seed different offerings. The second leg of the stool is pricing model. So first and foremost, picking a growing metric uh, that allows you to draft on underlying organic growth in the business. Uh, an example here is a company that had user-based pricing that was very flat over time, shifting to a records-based uh, pricing model that they knew based on data was growing 14% organically. I think one of the key learnings here is you don't have to absorb all of that upside. You can share that with your customers. In this case, they instituted a volume discounting program as well that brought that down to a 5% annual increase. But still, that is essentially being able to ride a, 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 a drafting a upwards metric that allowed them to chip away at that kind of overarching goal of getting to 20% plus in bookings growth. On the right-hand side, more an example of structures used to uh, really fine-tune a land product. So creating something that breaks the typical volume discount structure that most folks have in their mind and says, actually, what we want to accomplish is we want to create a very digestible entry stage product. In this team collaboration product, it was $10 per month for up to 10 users, a dollar per user per month, less than a cup of coffee. Highly attractive, but without being free without dipping your toe into freemium, still creating something that is much cheaper than their standard pricing, um, but digestible as a land option. Last one here is around segmentation. Two messages here. One, making sure that you're targeting your messages to different use cases and roles. An example here of a company that had a pricing page uh, with four packages, six pages of features, long unfocused pricing pages, poor online conversion. The key step for them and their recurring revenue model was really creating separate package lineups for different use cases. Even just simplifying their offering, uh, creating unique upsell paths led to a 60% plus conversion improvement. Last point here, that same type of segmentation approach can apply to the expand side as well. Uh, when uh, best in class companies look at price increases over time, they're not looking at it as a flat, should I be able to get CPI or 5% uh, year over year? They're looking at it from a customer-specific basis and saying, what is really the risk of an individual customer? Can I profile that customer's, uh, risk toler our, uh, that customer's risk profile and use that to set price increase targets? Looking at things like support levels they received, customer satisfaction, usage data, to really identify, first of all, who should receive a price increase or are there sleeping dogs we should leave alone? Setting differentiated levels of price increases and even using that information to set different uh, messaging and argumentation for your sales force to defend a price increase. So to summarize, the most important thing in a recurring revenue model is really this land and expand strategy. And it's not just about buzzwords, it's derived from the unique economics of a land and expand model uh, with a much lower cost of sale for these upsell usage expansion retention activities. Um, and there are interesting ways to apply those learnings that, may, that build on your typical marketing toolkit, uh, but are very specific to the recurring revenue model. And at that point, I, this point I'll hand it over to Bill, who is going to talk about an uh, example of really transitioning to a recurring revenue model in detail. All right, thank you, Josh. Um, See if I can get my there we go. Um, let's see if I can page down. Good. So I uh, this is Bill Graber with Trimble. Uh, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. And I uh, just have a safe harbor statement here. Um, I don't plan on saying anything that's too out of line relative to future the future of Trimble. Uh, but just in case I do, I wanted to make sure that that was covered. Um, okay, so uh, why is SaaS important to Trimble? Uh, Trimble is a, is a very, uh, uh, well, has historically been a very hardware-centric company. And uh, in the process of going to a lot more software, uh, it's uh, important for us to uh, look at what's happening in the rest of the software industry. And we see a lot of our, uh, so some of the competitors that we have, 
And, uh, you know, we've acquired uh, 200, uh, over 200 different software applications over the last 10 years. So there's a lot of uh, uh, breadth and, and um, different types of applications that we're involved in. And as, uh, uh, as uh, time goes on, we see a lot of our competitors moving over to um, hosted applications and monthly fees. Uh, Adobe being a, a good example, also AutoCAD, uh, and uh, historically we've been more of a perpetual or premise-based uh, software company uh, with our products, and so we're need, we see the need to make the move. Um, a lot of our uh, products that we sell uh, that used to be highly mechanical are becoming more and more uh, digital. Uh, uh, and uh, it's kind of a generic kind of uh, software, almost like a, a an iPad or a uh, a cell phone uh, where we can load our software onto those uh, types of hardware and then uh, use them as a SaaS-based uh, offering. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the uh, products that we sell are fairly expensive, and so what our, a lot of our customers like to do is like to take it off one piece of hardware uh, or, or revoke it from one piece of hardware and put it onto a different piece of hardware, move stuff around, and so in order for us to allow that type of activity, uh, we are looking at more of a, a SaaS model as well. Uh, a lot of our, uh, there's a big desire for hosted applications. It's a lot safer uh, in terms of uh, piracy or, or software abuse. Uh, and uh, it also is easier to support. We feel it's easier to support because uh, you're typically off, uh, 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 managing off of one version of software instead of maybe five or ten if it's premise-based, you know, because not everybody up is upgrading at the same time unless the application is hosted. Uh, we also uh, see a, a large need for data collaboration, uh, data sharing and routing, especially with some of the large projects that we've been involved with, uh, some airports, a lot of airports, uh, some canals, um, there's a lot of uh, rail projects that are going on right now, and so a lot of data sharing is needed there. So that's why having uh, the uh, uh, the cloud premise uh, software is important. And then reducing the cost of software installation and support. Obviously, when when you have applications that are uh, in the cloud and and people are logging in, then uh, it's a little bit easier to get get people access. Uh, and then finally eliminating software and, and firmware theft. And, and so that's a big, uh, one of the big reasons that we're partnered with, with Jamalto and, and Aria. Um, so uh, one of the things, so uh, Tr uh, Trimble really got its name from a uh, survey from uh, handheld receivers. They're called GNSS receivers. That's a global navigation system. And uh, they really, uh, Trimble became, uh, it's a big break was in the 1990s in the Operation Desert Storm. Uh, it was uh, General Schwarzkopf and uh, that uh, group. They ended up acquiring about four or 5,000 of these GNSS receivers for use in that, in that uh, conflict. And it really helped uh, the, uh, the Americans uh, come out uh, successfully in that, in that event. And then from there, it's gone on and on. We sell a lot. Our biggest, uh, our biggest group is, is still us, our survey team. And, and if you're a survey person, you really can't go anywhere without a, a GNSS receiver. Well, now uh, the uh, cost of, it used to be $30,000, $40,000 for one of these devices. The cost has come down dramatically. And it's actually turning into software that you can actually load onto an uh, iPad or some kind of a tablet or even a cell phone. Uh, and a lot of our guys uh, and our enthusiasts that we work with, they take these GNS, the GNS receivers everywhere, especially the climbing mountains. The climbing mountains and checking, you know, uh, uh, validating of the height of a particular mountain, whether it's Mount Denali in Alaska or uh, other places, uh, Mount Rainier, uh, Mount Everest. Uh, and so we have a lot of uh, people that use our our uh, GNS receivers, and and the cost of the GNS receiver keeps coming down, and it's actually turning into a SaaS opportunity for us now. It's almost like uh, maybe you've heard some software definable radio before. Well, this is almost like software definable GSS, uh, GNSS, or or GPS. Uh, and so now we're selling a a uh, uh, a receiver, it's actually more like an antenna. It hooks up to a cell phone or, a, or an iPad, and uh, you can dial in your app.
depending on what what use case you have. Uh, and so for even, you know, for, uh, commercial certified uh, uh, surveys, uh, people, they're moving to this type of technology now because uh, they don't need to buy a 10 or a $20,000 piece of hardware. Uh, so you can go from one meter, which is roughly $40 a month, all the way up to uh, $350 a month if you want centimeter accuracy or if you need sub-centimeter accuracy. And so we have a lot of people that are very interested in this product. We just launched it a few months ago. And, uh, and so we uh, expect to see quite a bit of activity uh, relative to this uh, SAS type of handheld receiver, especially for survey people. Okay, in addition to that, we also are involved with something called aerial photogrammetry. And uh, these are, um, these are uh, drone or uh, unmanned aerial air aircraft systems. Uh, they cover about a uh, two to four uh, square mile radius in roughly 30 minutes, and they take somewhere in the neighborhood of two billion points of uh, geospatial data. Uh, and then uh, they come back down, and then that data, then that turns out to be about a 10 gig file, needs to be converted into a map or into a point cloud. It's almost like a video game. Uh, and uh, that process takes uh, on a laptop, a really high-end laptop would take two to three, maybe four days of just, just that laptop sitting and trying to create that map. And so cloud computing is a huge opportunity for, for aerial photogrammetry. And it's something that we're um, uh, definitely uh, moving towards. We don't have this product launch yet, but we're very close. Um, and uh, again, you know, the, our guys have had the opportunity to go ahead and, and photograph all these fa fantastic places, including Petra and uh, Easter Island and Everglades. Uh, so when we launch this, and we're very close, we'll have a data hosting uh, service, which will be an annual license, uh, and it will be, um, there will be a few different types, and it will include a certain number of flights, but each time you, uh, you want to do a new flight, another good opportunity for this, by the way, is landfills, because landfills are constantly needing to measure, you know, what do they get, 30, 30 million cubic yards uh, of uh, space or something like that, and whenever they're uh, filling that up, they need to make sure they have the compaction maximized, so they'll go over They'll go over the top of these landfills with these uh, drones and just make sure that they're uh, compacting properly. Um, and so there'll be a number of flights, uh, which will be a prepaid license, and then a hosting, which will be an annual, we call it a subscription license. And that the different types of licenses that we're looking at here, the typically subscription is the most common one, almost like a cell phone, right? Uh, where you, And it can either be monthly or it can be uh, annual, typically those two, sometimes daily. Uh, but then we also are looking at prepaid, uh, and, and the difference there is if you're, if you're that's like a per use, and that can be a, t a period of time, like a day or a month or whatever, but it can also be a, a per use, like a flight. Each flight is about 10 gigabytes of data, and it takes about two or three days of cloud computing, or of, um, uh, for, in the cloud, it only takes a couple hours, but on a laptop, it takes uh, two or three days of computing to to uh, complete, so it's a good uh, it's a good uh, uh, opportunity. At least we consider it a good opportunity for SaaS for software as a service. And then here's another uh, scenario, another uh, solution that we we built, and we so we did this a couple years ago. Started it last year, and this is called dynamic compaction. And it's a little bit bizarre because what they do is they take this 30 ton drum, they pull it up about 40 or 50 uh, feet in the air, and then they drop it. And each time it drops, it, it sinks into the ground, but each consecutive drop, it sinks less and less and less. And after about nine or 10 drops, uh, roughly on average, then it will stop, you know, the, they will stop sinking into the ground um, and uh, it compresses, right? And what's interesting is the uh, degree of compression isn't just at the surface, it actually compresses down as far down as, it, as you drop it from. So it'll compress all the way down 50 feet. And then they come over uh, uh, to uh, level everything off with these, drum, with these drums, with these rollers. And they'll use a crooked one to get everything kind of uh, uh, leveled off, and then they come out with circular ones. And so this, uh, this was done at uh, the Beijing National Airport. 
This is actually the uh, largest, going to be the largest single terminal airport in the world. I think it's due to come out, it's due to go uh, live or to launch in 2019. Um, now, in this particular case, uh, then for SAS, we we have a hosting service, right? So the the soft, there's software uh, that's on the crane uh, that will uh, uh, collect the compaction data, and then uh, it will get uh, transmitted to a hosted site. So again, that will be a monthly and an annual license to host all that data uh, in the cloud. And then we need to make a lot of different people, uh, give a lot of different people access to that data. So it's like a user-based uh, model. And then there's also job site monitoring associated with this solution. With, they have cameras all around um, just to make sure that nobody gets, you know, just to make sure that everything gets monitored appropriately because this is a fairly dangerous uh, uh, a work uh, job. And so uh, uh, online monitoring to make sure that, you know, monitoring of assets and job sites, and that can be accessed remotely. Uh, and then it also maintains a visual history of the job site with playback. So you can always go back and see what happened a day ago, a month ago, a year ago. And so those services are services that we're offering today. Uh, so, in final, uh, we're, uh, isn't it, by the way, uh, making these services available quickly is something that's very important, and so working with the partners that we have uh, really helps that. So we have a guy that's out in the field, he maybe needs a certain type of service, maybe he needs uh, better accuracy, or he needs to address a different uh, set of satellites, a different constellation. He should be able to do that in the field, order the service, and then the entitlement system knows the user, and then the billing system knows the pricing. He orders the service, uh, the uh, request gets managed, and then it gets delivered back to him, and the service is ready. In a, in a, we want to be in a period of seconds. It, uh, it's almost like uh, getting stuff on an iPhone, right? Uh, like ordering iTunes or something. And then EMS then will record that license, so we make sure that everything's uh, legal and there's no abuse, and then ARIA manages the transaction. So that's, this is the type of model that we really want to equate to where we can deliver the service quickly and in such a way that it's uh, cost effective for our customers. And with that, I will turn it over to Andres. Thank you, thank you, Bill. So very interesting. I mean, uh, we, we saw in the, uh, in the last uh, minutes how Trimble has really uh, moved uh, from essentially uh, monetizing you know, uh, or selling a hardware to monetizing uh, and selling a service and also, you know, going to monetizing and selling outcomes. So quite a transformation. Uh, here's another example of, um, you know, what Trimble is doing with, with us. Uh, Trimble is our customer, ARIA Systems. Another division of Trimble, you know, they, they have a, uh, it's a software solution called Trimble Connect. It's a cloud solution, it's for, pretty huge construction projects around the world. You know, we're talking billions of dollars. Uh, these are very complex projects with, you know, dozens uh, of contractors, you know, architects, engineers, uh, designers, uh, accessing this system to collaborate and work with each other. So we're talking about a pretty big system, lots of different users, different types of users, uh, different types of needs and uh, scenarios uh, in, in this collaboration. And uh, what Trimble does with us is they, they essentially allow everybody uh, to flip on the right access at the right time, make sure that, um, that uh, these people have paid and have the right entitlement, and then, then we're charging them for whatever they are using in this system. So uh, it's a second example of what Trimble is doing in terms of going to a SaaS world or going to a world where they are not selling uh, uh, one-time uh, items or purchases, but uh, migrating to recurring revenue. So wh what is going on? Why, why are companies like Trimble doing this? You know, the, the world was pretty, uh, 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 you know, we were all used to a world where you could purchase anything at what time and the company will charge you, you will get your goods or services and we're good to go. So that's, that, 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 it feels like last century. You know, at the time you had a product and a price, take it or leave it. If you don't like it, don't buy it. Uh, if you like it, you know, pay and, and get it. Over time, you know, the world uh, companies started to migrate in 
to a, a subscription model. Um, they realized that it was better to maintain a relationship with a customer, and it was, it's for predictability purposes, for convenience, and they're essentially responding to customers that want to pay uh, 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 they they want to pay as as they go. So you know, a product and a price was joined by just frequency, and it became a subscription. Uh, lately, we've been seeing that there are you know usage is becoming more important. So not only you have a product, a price, maybe a subscription to something, but you use and you want to pay for whatever you use. Uh, uh, this is, for example, the iTunes model. I mean, we are we probably don't think of ourselves as subscribers of Apple. But you know, you you go over there and you purchase and you pay as uh, for things as you consume them, and uh, it gives you options on when you consume it. And, and we've seen that the latest trend is that is that consumers uh, consumers are now wanting even more choice. You know, it's not only what you get and and when you get it and when you use it, but they, you know, there are a lot more other, other choices. What you pay for, uh, is it a credit card, is it a debit card, uh, is, is it PayPal, uh, who pays for what, uh, is, is financial responsibility. In the same account, you might have multiple users, multiple people. An account might be uh, representing a, a corporation that has multiple uh, regional and local entities. Who pays for what and in what currency, um, consumers and companies also have uh, choices in terms of or, or decides in terms of how they get notified and alerted. You know, I want to get a notification in my in my email. I want to get a notification in my as a text message. Um, I want the bill to be sent somewhere else. Uh, maybe it's in a different language. Maybe it's in a different currency. Uh, maybe the taxation of what I consume depends on where I am or the entity that is paying for it. So the, 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 the world, uh, of essentially the, the choices that consumers demand these days are, are way larger than just a few years and decades. So that's what, that's what um, essentially uh, the world is going to uh, providing customers with increased choice. Companies want to accommodate that choice, what customers want the multi-dimensional customer choice, and that's what um, that is our business. Uh, what Aria System does is enable companies to provide their customers, provide the customers with as much choice as they want and as the company wants to give them. Uh, so, you know, we, we essentially enable companies to uh, implement or deploy any monetization model. Uh, from very simple to complex and any combination. You know, maybe it's a, it's a one time, you wanna allow people to binge, uh, consume a lot, or pay, uh, activate something, it's a one time fee. Some people wanna do just basic subscriptions, say it's, it's $8 a month for Netflix, uh, it's very simple, or maybe it's monthly, maybe it's quarterly, annually, uh, or, 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 uh, or other. Uh, or if you want to uh, add maybe a, a, the ability to pay for consumption, for usage, things that you're using, uh, how do how you charge for that? Is it a, a, a minimum? Is it a flat rate? Uh, does the price change, the price per item change as you consume more? Is it tiered? Uh, are we going to charge, uh, you know, the maybe high water mark? Are we going to charge you for uh, the highest point in your consumption in a given period? Uh, maybe it's a rollover. We're gonna, you know, you 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 can roll over anything that you didn't use uh, to the next period, the next month. Uh, family plans, it's, uh, maybe pooling. You know, you, you have multiple users, companies, entities in an account. Uh, let them pool their consumption. Um, so, uh, what is interesting here is, you know, Simon Kutcher told us about the the, the pricing and how strategic pricing can really help you get more uh, out of your customers and satisfy them better without leaving money on the table. Uh, normally companies get that concept. Yes, it makes sense. We wanna price better, we wanna be smart, we wanna uh, essentially create value by allowing our customers to, to get more and buy more. Uh, then the, the, customer, the, the, the companies go and think, okay, I can think of this monetization model. Now, how do I do it? Can my IT systems, my processes deal with this at scale? Uh, that's where they turn to us, to Aria. That's our business. We enable all these models at scale uh, in a way that migrating from one monetization model to the other one. Uh, 
or adding 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 um, a, an additional monetization model, adding uh, an addition, changing a price, bundling products, unbundling them, changing the period, uh, changing the currency, going into another country. You've been successful in one country. You wanna you wanna now enable this service in another country? How do you do that at scale, rapidly? without having to go to an IT project. Uh, with a system like ARIA, it's all configuration. All these changes can be done very quickly. Uh, what this gives is flexibility to a product manager, a general manager, uh, uh, someone that administers or manages a portfolio of products or services to essentially launch quickly, test and alter, modify uh, their, their, their monetization uh, strategy, their products, their offerings, um, do it on the fly with configuration. So why is this relevant? If you think about it, you know, in the, in the old world, when you have one, uh, a one-time purchase or transaction, you know, everything was about getting a customer to buy. You know, all the metrics, all the efforts were, you know, how do I get my next customer? Now that you, you're thinking recurring revenue, I mean, that customer, you don't want that customer to go away. You want to engage that customer constantly through all the different touch points in the life cycle of that customer to create value for him or her and for the company. So anything from, you know, at the beginning, we just sign up the first customer. Uh, you know, you, 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 the customer purchase, you generate an invoice, and here we go. Uh, to what happens in between the bills? Uh, that customer is, is that customer consuming or not? If that customer is, you know, paid for something or subscribed to something, and you you see that the customer is not using it, the, the product, you want your system to alert uh, uh, alert your rep, uh, maybe send the instructions, a uh, reminder to this customer on how to use the system or the product. Maybe if the if the time of the next bill is approaching. You want to give this customer a credit or a discount because this person didn't use anything and, and it's about to churn. So uh, what happens if, if in, in, the other, uh, in the other extreme, if a customer is very successful at using a service or a product and uh, is reaching the maximum limit uh, of uh, whatever he bought, movies, songs, gigabytes, um, and uh, it's, the customer is essentially using up everything that he bought, you want, this is the perfect time to offer this customer an upgrade and realize more revenue. We call all these uh, revenue moments. Essentially, is the orchestration of more revenue for a company. This is what a system like ours uh, does for, for our customers. Essentially, um, drive or derive insights in, from usage, who's using, who's not using, how happy are they, what is the right time to offer a promotion, an upgrade, how do I retain customers that are, that are about to churn? How do I identify them and engage them? And for, some, for, for many customers, many of our customers, the bill is actual, the actual only touch point with a customer. Uh, you know, a question for you, how many of you have you know, utilities, other type of services, companies where you don't really hear from a company except you know, once a month in a bill? So, so that bill has to be perfect, accurate, informational, and anything that, that, uh, that the customer expects has to be there. So uh, that's what ARIA does uh, at scale for companies, enable any monetization model, enable launching new products, e-trading, changing pricing, bundling, promotions, and engaging customers throughout the life cycle to uh, generate more revenue and reduce churn or retain customers keep them happy uh, for life. So here I'm going to show you just a few examples, selected examples of companies that have successfully moved from a one-time to a recurring revenue model. So what, from one-time purchases to um, a recurring model, uh, you see all industries, you know, from uh, companies like Audi, they make cars, but hey, they have Audi on demand. If you want a, an Audi, you know, Q7 to show up in your doorstep through a concierge service, you subscribe and you, you can order it from your cell phone. Uh, Subaru, uh, they are, you know, the, the, the new car, the, the car is the new platform. All your digital services will follow you to your car. Companies like Roku, 
you know, you want to buy a movie, you want to subscribe to HBO, you want to, you know, change your subscriptions every, every day. I mean, that's no problem. The, the Roku platform enables you to, uh, gives you all the choice to move up and down in the, in, in, in what services you subscribe to. Uh, co companies like Trimble, you just heard from Trimble, companies like Generac, they do power generators, but they want to be close to the customer uh, and, and uh, maintain a relationship, you know. Uh, we've seen in, in telecom companies like, uh, like uh, uh, TDC, which is uh, Telecom Denmark, you know, pretty much everything they do goes through, through a recurring revenue model. They offer you internet, movies, entertainment, and of course, telecom services. Uh, of course, in the world of high tech, you know, all the SaaS companies, software as a service, by definition, it's a recurring revenue model, but companies that make gadgets like Netgear, you know, they, in the past they, they sold a gadget, a consumer electronic device. Now they are, they are selling you the device, but they also give you a subscription. They, they for example, uh, one of the most successful products they've launched recently is called the Arlo. It's a camera you buy for security in your house. The camera is recording um, by default, I think it's like five minutes of video. You can see who's coming at your doorstep or, or whatever the camera is pointing, but you can subscribe to record uh, an hour, 10 hours, or everything. And essentially, you, you, you pay monthly, a monthly fee. So it's a company that has moved from selling gadgets to selling the gadget and services that go with these gadgets. And uh, the same gadget can enable many, many different services with different price points and, uh, and value. Uh, companies like Adobe, of course, Foster Child Company, that has gone from, from a one-time sale to, a, to the cloud, to a recurring revenue model. So, so everybody in, is doing it essentially in all industries, companies like Experian that monetize financial data. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for, for participating. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Bill. Uh, that was the content for this um, webinar. Let me now open it to uh, questions and answers. So here you can see we have our, our email addresses. We'll be happy to take any, any questions that you have uh, via email uh, or here live uh, in the Q&A session. So let's, let's, uh, let me go to the first question. Uh, let's see, wow, we have a ton of questions here. First question will be for uh, Josh. What are the most commonly used pricing metrics for software companies? Great question, and one I get asked a lot. Uh, this is something that has actually changed over time as well. We've been tracking kind of uh, metric uh, uh, usage over the years. It, it used to be that seat-based uh, pricing was about 50% of software monetization, uh, and that has shifted. So the best picture I have right now is that approximately one-third of licensing is based on seats, one third on usage, and the other third is a mix of different company factors like sites, employees, database size, or others. Um, and it really is that, that one third that is the usage-based pricing that is growing fastest uh, for obvious reasons. It's got the, the greater ability to actually track usage uh, and tie that back to, to value delivered um, that comes from SaaS applications. Great, thank you, thank you, Josh. So let's go to the next question, uh, Bill. Is Trimble planning or testing promotional pricing? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question, um, and we do uh, have all. We well, we have several different uh, methods of uh, doing promotional pricing, um, and the, 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 the I mean, you've heard the word freemium or free period or a derated period. And uh, the nice thing about uh, SaaS or about you know a subscription model is, and even a prepaid uh, model is that you can test that you can you can build that pretty easily. Um, and so having a uh, three month free period, ninety day free period, pretty common, or uh, or a uh, derated free period uh, is something that uh, is pretty well. It's it's pretty doable. Uh, with uh, this type of a model. It's much more doable with this type of a model than it is with Perpetual. And so those are the types of things that we like to, to work with. And it gives the uh, end customers a chance to uh, 
to uh, pe a puppy dog or to play with the product or to kind of try the product out uh, before investing in it heavily. So one comment that I want to make is that uh, uh, the, the uh, small typo here, but under my name, it's, it says bill.graber at jamalto.com. My email address is bill underscore graber at trimble.com. So just make a note of that. You might be able to get to me through that address too, uh, but uh, bill underscore graber at trimble.com is the one that I use most of the time. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So, uh, Bill, what, another question for you, and is uh, what other Trimble divisions plan to move towards consumption or tier billing? Uh, why the move, and what model? Well, the the uh, uh, we have a bunch of different divisions, and quite frankly, we recently changed uh, uh, kind of our, our organization a little bit. Uh, so we have construction. And construction is, uh, they're very interested in this type of a model uh, because they have small projects and big projects. I mean, some of the projects take most, like three or four or five or even 10 years, and other projects may only take 30 days or, or, or 45 days. So a lot of our customers are asking for this kind of uh, flexibility. Uh, they don't need to be buying $100,000 worth of software if they're only going to use it for a short period of time. Um, in addition to that, we have a large transportation group, uh, and they are looking at different models for, uh, and we're even getting involved in some of this, uh, uh, some of this uh, driverless vehicle stuff, you know, and so in those scenarios, you know, it, it's really conducive for, uh, for a staff type of model. Uh, we're working in heavily in the ag and natural resources divisions, including forestry and, uh, and mining. And so uh, you end up with uh, different types of uh, uh, requirements almost on a uh, monthly or even weekly basis. And so for us to try and uh, offer those services or provide those services in a temporary fashion is something that our customers are really, are really looking for. Okay, thank you, Bill. So here's a question for me, probably. What are the advantages of a cloud uh, application? So, so I mean, the advantages for, for for a cloud application is you don't have to buy any hardware, you don't have to um, deal with the software, you don't have to uh, keep a, an eye on whether the systems are working or not. Essentially, it's very quick to deploy, um, no headaches on your end, uh, and um, it's way cheaper than owning your, your own servers, your own software, and people to keep the lights on and, and, and monitor what's going on. So. Essentially, the advantages would be, you know, total cost of ownership is lower and very quick deployment. So that's it. Another question here, are you planning on sharing the slides? For sure, yes. Everybody uh, in this, um, in this attending the webinar will get the presentation slide. You also get the recording when we finish. Uh, so you, you, you have that for your reference and you can ideally share with others when, if you if you see fit, if you think they can benefit from that, uh, please feel free to to do so. Um, so that's coming. Another question here: How can usage be metered or or, uh, or or monetized for augmented reality experiences in the real world? So maybe uh, Josh, you can comment, and then I can comment on that. In terms of. Uh pricing around and monetization about augmented reality experiences. Um, it's interesting, we've actually done some work with development platforms for augmented reality, um, and uh, in general, I would broaden that to even say IoT applications, um, because a lot of these are uh, augmented reality around devices specifically. Um, one of the things that uh, is interesting for me that, that I've seen looking at forecast, the vast majority of augmented reality monetization will come from industrial applications. Uh, something on the order of 80% is the forecast over the next few years. So augmented reality, um, 
obviously virtual reality headsets and things like that are getting a lot of press now, and we've worked with those types of companies as well. But the, the long tail that is coming is kind of industrial applications, things like being able to dispatch, instead of dispatching, dispatching technicians to help with uh, industrial fixes, having augmented reality instructions that someone on site can use, um, there, there's a lot coming down the pipeline uh, that that really pose interesting interesting opportunities <laughs> for for folks in the augmented reality space. Excellent. So on on my end, I can add that anything that can be meter counted um, can be used for monetization. Aria can can use that to uh, to to monetize, uh, monitor what's going on, um, and and. So if you can if you can if you can meter it, we can use it. Essentially, that that's uh, if if it's gigabytes, if it's uh, number of times you use the system, if it's, it's number of uh, concurrent users, if it's anything you can count, we can ingest and we can combine uh, into pretty much uh, any monetization model you can dream of. So uh, the the key is being able to to uh, quantify it. So here's another interesting question, maybe. Uh, uh, for, for all of us. How are public companies moving from a historical license and maintenance model to a subscription model without showing a reduction in revenue during the transition? Uh, so Josh, you wanna take this one? I'll, sure. I can, I can chime in at the I, end. I, I, I can, I can take the first crack at this one. Um, it is a challenge, obviously, and you see uh, plenty of examples of companies being taken private to really undergo a recurring revenue model transition, but there are cases of companies that have done so successfully. Um, Blackbaud, a fundraising software company, comes to mind. Their stock price has doubled since they, they turned their flagship product into a software as a service offering, and uh, part of the reason that companies are able to do that successfully is they are able to both tackle uh, subscription pricing for new logos at the same time that they are extracting more from their installed base. So of course, kind of the, the new logo, new deal revenue goes down, but if they're able to create a bridge from their installed base to higher revenue, uh, those two factors can kind of uh, blend in and, and not have it be a, a, as much of a one-time shock uh, to revenue development. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And I mean, we, we, we've seen with, with some of our customers that the, uh, when they go to a recurring revenue model, changing the price and offering alternative price points, uh, you increase the size of the pie. So you might get less money from your next customer right now, but uh, in the long run, you probably will get more. And also there will be uh, others that would buy or subscribe or use that otherwise would not. Uh, you know, if you had a $2,000 entry point for, you know, sophisticated software and all of a sudden you go to a, you know, $20, $30, $50 a month uh, subscription, uh, you, you will see people that would never pay the $2,000, but now they are uh, inclined to, to pay for the, for the monthly subscription. So it's, uh, it's all, uh, also about maybe increasing the size of the pie by allowing uh, uh, the, the, the demand to uh, satisfy demand that otherwise would go unsatisfied. So I think we've covered pretty much all questions and we are almost out of time. Uh, thank you all. We essentially saw how, how strategic pricing, smart pricing can create value for you and the consumer. Bill show us an example, Trimble, uh, on how a, a, a traditional uh, a company that was selling hardware now is selling experiences, outcomes, subscriptions, recurring revenue models. And uh, with me, we touch on how to do this at scale, how, in, how to enable your, your systems and processes to uh, do this at scale quickly uh, and with uh, um, you know, the flexibility and agility to test new models, alter the pricing, alter the bundling, uh, change the offering, and essentially capitalize on the opportunity quickly. Thank you everybody for attending and uh, we'll see you in our next webinar. Thank you so much.